So, good evening and welcome to the fifth of the 2014 Darwin College Lecture Series, which is, as you know, is on the broad theme of plagues. In, just in case you've forgotten, here it is behind us. And welcome to all of you here in the Lady Mitchell Hall and to all the people who watch these lectures later on, uh, because they're freely available on the web. And as most of you know, this is a very important year for Darwin College as we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the foundation of the college as the first uh, exclusive college for graduate students in the University of Cambridge and as the first mixed college. So from a very small beginning, we're now among one of the, one of the largest colleges with uh, our alumni encompassing every subject and spread around the world. So this evening, I'm very pleased to welcome... Professor Stephen O'Brien. Stephen is a molecular biologist with very wide research interests, including the plague. He uses uh, genome sequencing to understand diseases, others are uh, HIV AIDS, uh, as well as to inform the conservation of endangered species. His team identified the first restriction gene that imparts immunity to HIV. He's worked on the genomes of many species, including cheetahs and red pandas and, and on and on. He's a founder of the Genome 10K project that is assembling a genomic zoo, the genomes of 10,000 vertebrate species. He's had a four decades long career at the National Cancer Institute in the US during which he served for 25 years as the founder and chief of the Genomic Diversity Lab. Then two years ago, he crossed to this side of the Atlantic to join St. Petersburg State University, where he's the chief scientific officer at the Center for Genome Bioinformatics. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Stephen O'Brien to speak on plagues, population, and survival. Stephen. <laughs> Good evening. Is the microphone on? Okay, good. Um, it's a special pleasure to come here to Cambridge and to Darwin College uh, in order to talk to you about an area that I think also think is very fascinating, the subject of the series, which are plagues. Um, plagues, pestilence, disease, mortality, horror, We've all heard and read, imagined, some have experienced them. But today, science is beginning to weigh in a little bit on some of the details. However, in one man or woman's life, we're not so concerned day by day because it doesn't happen very often. In fact, one observer mentioned to me that world pandemics seem to occur about once a generation, every 30 years or so, as is illustrated by the slide here. Spanish flu in 1918, polio in 1950, HIV AIDS 1982, SARS 2003. There were others, but none as horrific as these. And during that time, it has been really interesting to look back and look forward, but with the new tools that allow us to not only explore questions unanswerable in the past, but also allow us to make some recommendations about and observations about the disease plagues which have afflicted humankind. One thing we have discovered is that there's a delicate balance between the host and their pathogens, which is a bit akin to a deadly arms race, waged fiercely almost daily, and multiplied over individuals, populations, across geography, and even among the 4,000 mammal species that survive on Earth today. That struggle is frequently lost. It's never really won. Simply temporarily circled with the survivors rising once again to compete for another day. I'm old enough to recall 
back in the late 60s when the U.S. Surgeon General was a man named William Stewart, and he pronounced proudly that the end to the horrors of infectious disease. He was encouraged by the success of antibiotics, vaccines against smallpox, measles, mumps, and polio. He predicted a swift shift in biomedical emphasis from infectious diseases to chronic diseases that he didn't really know how to cure. Then came AIDS, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, papilloma, hantavirus, SARS, West Nile, mad cow disease. Modern medicine has far from conquered these infections. In fact, I don't think we're even close. I'm going to tell you three stories here today to illustrate how scientists, including members of our team, have learned from taking a population, evolutionary, and molecular approach to understanding diseases. I'm going to start about 12 years ago when a severe flu-like outbreak began to appear in the emergency rooms of hospital around uh, Guangzhou, Nanning, and Hong Kong, a devastating syndrome that defied any and all treatments. It was a new to medicine, to science, to people, and it was called the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. Within nine months, it traversed to 29 countries, infected over 8,000 people, and killed almost 800. The alarming speed and virulence of transmission was dazzling, and was illustrated by a couple of examples. In one of the hospitals in Hong Kong, a patient arrived with this disease, which no one had ever seen before. And within a few days, 112 people who had come in contact with him had come down with the same disease. There was an apartment complex in Hong Kong called the Amoy Gardens. A young woman who contracted SARS went to her apartment and stayed there. But the virus spread through the ventilation system, and within a few weeks, 321 people were infected. Residents who never had any contact with this patient. In March 2003, several groups who were studying this disease, which was terrifying and changing the culture in southern China and in northern China, worked independently to describe the cause of this disease. It was a virus, one that was familiar to veterinary practitioners, but not so much to humans. It was in a group called coronaviruses. This is an evolutionary tree which shows the genetic distance between some of the coronaviruses that we know about. About one-third of common colds are caused by coronavirus. This is uh, one of the uh, uh, coronaviruses here, and this is one that causes human diseases. But these over here cause disease in chickens and in turkeys, and this is a mouse virus. This is a domestic cat and dog virus listing over here, and this is a porcine or pig virus. The SARS virus was in this group, but it sat out here on a limb as if it was really a new isolate that hadn't been seen before. Now, initially, there was a rush to find out where this virus came from. The sequence of the virus was determined, which led to the tree you're looking at right here, and a number of specimens were looked for to be reservoirs. One of the ones that was identified was farmed palm civets, a relative of the cat, which were, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of them in captivity in China that were basically being used in the, 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 uh, as a farm market for food. So the government of China, which was a little very uncomfortable with this, one of the things they did was they ordered the extirpation of about 10,000 of these these palm civets. However, the palm civet was only the unlikely passenger. A few years later, it was the horseshoe bat that was shown to be the primary reservoir from which this came from. In June of 2004, the epidemic stopped. It subsided in May, excuse me, of 2003, presumably consequence of a draconian quarantine measures. The epidemic scared us by its fervent fervent economic catastrophe, which has been estimated in the order of tens of billions of dollars. 
Now, 10 or 12 years later, we still don't have a really clear understanding of the precise mode of transmission. We have no laboratory-based clinical diagnosis other than PCR. We have no vaccine, and there's really no treatment. The mortality of this virus was about 10%, an emerging disease that spread at rather lightning field. But it stopped, as I said, in May of 2003, and really hasn't surfaced so much except for a small outbreak in the, in the, in the, in the Middle East, which is going on right now. Now, it did change the culture in China, where people would wear, wear masks. There were no handshakes, kisses, or any other kinds of unmentionable contact because of the fear of what this was going on. Now, <clears throat> as I said, it was familiar to the veterinary uh, uh, profession because many of these viruses are known to cause disease in cats. And I remembered when I began reading about this an, an, an effect that very few other people did, which was an epidemic of a similar coronavirus which took place back in the early 1980s. And it occurred in a wildlife park in Oregon and it afflicted this species, the African cheetah. At that time, we had begun our interest in wildlife species, particularly trying to find out the consequences of, 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 of historical events on their fitness and their adaptation in their breeding and captivity. And we had discovered that the cheetah was remarkable among other cat species, principally because it had a highly reduced level of genetic diversity relative to other cats. It was an outlier of several thousand species that had been looked at with a series of different measurements that quantified the amount of overall variation. If each of you looks at the person next to you, there's 10 million DNA differences between you and that person. Cheetahs have fewer than a few hundred thousand between each animal, a hundred times to a thousand times less. And this was validated in a number of different methodologies which are available across the years because it was so surprising. And it was explaining in some ways the difficulty that zoo managers were having in breeding cheetahs in captivity, while at the same time they were very easy to breed other cats like lions and tigers and many other species. One correlate of inbreeding in this particular cheetah population was that its sperm morphology had a lot of problems. This is a series of sperm which are malformed found in cheetahs, three heads, two heads, bent tails, droplets, uh, large heads, tiny heads. This is a very rare cheetah sperm. About 10% of cheetah sperm are normal. The rest, 90%, are abnormal. And the reason for the cheetah's genetic uniformity and the consequences were imputed by other methodologies to trace back to an event that occurred in North America about 10,000 years ago when the glaciers retreated for the last time. During that evolutionary epoch called the late Pleistocene, something like 40 species of large mammals disappeared as the glaciers retreated for the last time. These included the mastodons and mammoths, the giant saber-toothed cats, the giant ground sloths, the dire wolf, several predatory birds, and the American cheetah, which has actually evolved in North America as a sort of a sister species with pumas and so forth. That particular event extirpated all these large mammals. We don't know really why. But they all went away, and pumas even went away from North America to be refounded by migration from South America. But that event was kind of interesting, and it caught the conservation community by surprise because it meant that endangered species, which have dropped to low numbers, can c contain a hidden hidden curse or axe hanging over their head, and the cheetah was a good example. And that could display itself, and it as it has been shown in many other species, in different ways, uh, including congenital abnormalities that are elevated, including reproductive abnormalities, such as the cheetah displayed. But one of the things that was kind of interesting was that the immune system was also homogenized. And this led us to worry and speculate that perhaps the cheetah's genetic situation would make it 
uh, sort of more vulnerable for any infectious disease that might drop into the species. Because genetic diversity itself among the immune system is basically something that is adaptive and keeps individual populations alive when pathogens overcome the defenses of the first individual. That's sort of the traditional wisdom as it were. Well, no sooner had we speculated it when we saw a realization of this horrific prediction at a wildlife park, which up at that time in the early 1980s was perhaps the most successful cheetah breeding organization in North America. They had about 60 cheetahs, and they were producing a number of different individuals. A couple of cheetahs were imported from the Sacramento Zoo. Their names were Tamu and Saba, and those two became patient zero in an epidemic. What happened to Tama and Sabu is they came to the zoo, or to the wildlife safari park, They were isolated in quarantine, as was the the method at that town. But they had a fever, and they had little twitches, and they were looking a little bit jaundiced. And eventually, in spite of aggressive symptomatic therapy by the veterinary clinicians on site at the place, the animals would collapse, dehydrated, and pass away. At the necropsy, which is a veterinary term for autopsy, their bellies were opened up and it was filled with this milky proteinaceous fluid. And this was something that the clinicians recognized because they'd seen it before in other cats, particularly domestic cats, as a symptom of a disease called feline infectious peritonitis. Feline infectious peritonitis is caused by a coronavirus, the first cousin of the, of the, of the SARS virus, but distant enough. And what it does is it generates a hyperimmune reaction which accumulates uh, immunoglobulin complexes in the peritoneum, this milky fluid, and strangulates the tissues and the animals die. The clinicians and the managers of this park were rather upset because they were worried that the coronavirus might, the feline infectious peritonitis virus, might spread to other cheetahs. And, of course, it did. Now, because of the fact that banked serum samples were held by the clinicians and the veterinarians, it was possible to track the appearance of antibodies against the the standard FIP virus by simply measuring individuals over a period of time. Before the arrival of patient zero, these five animals in, in this family were negative, but within six months of the arrival of the patient zeros and their death, they all developed antibodies. And Five of the six of these animals were dead within a year of this disease. This family group was not the only individuals in the wildlife safari that succumbed to this disease. In fact, they all did. The next slide is a blow-up of a number of different uh, slides like this, which were put together and published by Jonathan Heaney when he was a postdoc in our laboratory 20 years ago. And this particular uh, slide illustrates that for each cheetah in the park, before 1982, they were all negative. But within the next year, every animal in Syria converted and developed antibodies because the virus was so infected. It is, it is, it is uh, excreted in the, in, in, in the feces, and it is uh, because the hygiene in these places cannot be perfect, it spread to all of them rather quickly through the food and through the hands and through the keepers. The arrows indicate the deaths of these animals. As you can see, nearly all of them died. About within three years, uh, there was a 100% morbidity, which means 100% symptoms. There wasn't a normal stool in the park. They all had diarrhea. They all had the jitters. There was jaundice everywhere, and most of the animals, like 60% of them, would die within three years of the original outbreak. This was a horrifying example of the homogeneity of this particular uh, 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 result of this of, of this individual, and what we what we uh, concluded was that perhaps that the animals had gotten a virus which had gotten into the in, and into the cheetahs and had spread through it quickly, perhaps because of the genetic uniformity of the immune system of these animals. Well, when the SARS epidemic took place, we had in our freezers. Uh, tissues from the cheetah epidemic, which took place in the 1980s. Now, for those scientists in the audience, 
you'll know that in the 1980s there was no PCR, there was no sequencing. We didn't know very much about these viruses. But when the SARS epidemic took place back in 2003, we were more capable. So what happened was some of the youngsters in the laboratory took a look at the sequence of the SARS virus and the coronaviruses, and they developed primers to go back into the cheetahs to see, first of all, are they related to the SARS virus? And second of all, uh, what is the situation with respect to their uh, 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 getting into the uh, 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 epidemic? And so we wondered if we uh, looked at the sequence of these individuals of the cheetahs, where it would find out. Well, mercifully, AJU, which is a Latin abbreviation for a cheetah, came out on the limb very close to the domestic cat version of FIP. Now, what I should mention to you is that FIP in domestic cats is a nasty disease that pretty much had told us the story I just told you. However, one thing is important, and that is that the incidence of mortality in domestic cats, even an outbreak, is seldom over 5%. And that mor morbidity is on the order of 10%, that is symptoms. 90% of them don't get sick. So the truth is that uh, we were surprised at the cheetah outbreak seeing, being so uniform. Furthermore, when we examined a series of, of different uh, isolates of the cheetah virus, it basically, and compared it to domestic cat versions, they were nested within the genetic cluster in terms of their genetic identity, a long way away from the canine virus or the, or the turkey virus and so forth. They weren't like the SARS virus percolating out somewhere. This was a B-flat normal house cat virus was jumped into cheetahs. Furthermore, we actually did an experiment with these animal, with, the, with these viruses. We had a few house cats that were naive, and we isolated virus from the cheetahs, and we put them into 10 house cats to see if they would develop disease. None of them did. And this is kind of what we expected for a normal house cat virus. Because remember I said that normally in house cats, the mortality is less than 10%. So, if you go back, then let's talk about what I've just said. The mortality differs a lot in cheetahs. The cheetahs had between 60% mortality, 100% morbidity. House cats was 1% to 2% mortality. The SARS, as bad as it was, was 5 to 10%. And the reason that we believe this is so is that the genetics of the cheetah was identical. Uh, one of the other pieces of evidence that we had to reaffirm this, this conclusion was there were 10 lions at Wildlife Safari. They all became infected, they all seroconverted, they all developed antibodies. None of them got sick. So it wasn't just a virulent virus which was hopping into all these species. It was a normal house cat virus, but it overcame the, the genetics of the first individual of the cheetah. It looked around, they were all the equivalent of genetic or immunological clones and it went through it like a train through a station. Our conclusion, and the sobering conclusion, was that the cheetah's outbreak was excessive and horrible because the genetic diversity had been depleted by that long time ago situation in the late Pleistocene. It was a sobering example, and people in breeding, breeding cheetahs then immediately started to screen for this virus every time because the cheetahs have this hypersusceptibility. My second story has to do with an outbreak and an epidemic that really began in 1982 or so. It began earlier, but we didn't know about it until the early 1980s when a series of, 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 of actively gay men came down with a rare uh, pneumonia and a rare cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, that immediately was shown to be the disease we now know as AIDS. Which, and a few years later, it was discovered that HIV was the virus that causes it, a lentivirus related to a sheep virus and some of the other viruses we've seen in other species. In fact, there are lentivirus relatives in a number of different species. There's uh, one in, 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 in uh, <coughs> monkeys, there's one in cattle, there's one in sheep, and there's one in horses. And these are photographs of these different lentiviruses. Well, <coughs> around... Around 1988-89, a woman named Marla Brown, who lived in Petaluma, California, shows up at the UC Davis Veterinary College and says, my cat's kind of sick. I think my cat has AIDS. 
And the veterinarians looked at it and said, yeah, right. (laughs) However, Niels Peterson, who was a talented veterinary clinician at UC Davis, said, well, let me look at your cat. He took some blood out, and he co-cultured them with different kinds of tissue culture cells. And then he asked whether or not those tissue culture cells, two weeks later, made any particles or excreted anything that had reverse transcriptase enzyme, which is an indicator of a retrovirus like HIV. One of them did. He wrote a paper. He characterized it. He took the pictures. He says, we have feline immunodeficiency virus. Marla Brown was right. Her cat had AIDS, but she didn't have it from HIV. She had it from a cat version. The symptoms of feline AIDS are very similar, and there have been a number of studies where cats throughout the world have been studied by talented clinical veterinarians. If you look at this list of definitions, it's basically very similar to HIV AIDS, flu-like symptoms, weight loss, depletion of the CD4, lymphocytes, skin lesions, bacterial infections, opportunistic infections. This is exactly what kills HIV AIDS patients. These cats getting the same disease, a pretty good model. My colleagues and I, by this time, had done a lot of traveling to Africa, Asia, South America, collecting specimens, tissues, and serum from many members of the cat family. And I was terrified that perhaps some of these animals would be infected with FIV. FIV is a virus with ash like HIV. HIV at that time was as deadly A diagnosis is a bullet to the head. 95% of people with HIV died. So I was terrified that the cats would have it. To make a long story short, uh, Bob Olmsted and Jen Troyer mounted a screen for FIV in non-domestic cats to see how many of these wildlife species actually have FIV. They develop a test called Western Blot, which is an electrophoretic method, where they took Marla Brown's cat virus and they basically put it on a gel, electrophoresed it, separated it in electric current, and then stained it with a a labeled antibody which recognizes the uh, antibody, uh, um, which would recognize the uh, antibodies in a lion or a cheetah or a puma. And what you can see here is that the lions, actually several of them, showed a nice black band, which meant that they had antibodies as if they had been exposed to something like Marla Brown's sick cat. The same thing with cheetahs. There was a few of them that had it, and the same thing with American pumas. We were terrified of this and mounted a survey of over 3,000 samples we had in the laboratory at the time, and we found FIV antibodies in a lot of individuals. This is an illustration of several populations of American pumas. The pie charts give you an indication of the percent of those animals that had antibodies against the feline AIDS virus. As you can see, throughout the West and Central America and South America, virtually every population had a few animals, if not half the animals, that were infected with FIV. When we looked at other species in South America, such as the ocelot, the margay, the Jeffrey's cat, the pampas cat, they were all positive too. Not every cat, but many of them had it. In Africa, 10% of the cheetahs had antibodies to feline immunodeficiency virus. In, In Africa, leopards had it. In fact, it was endemic in about 12 of the 37 species of cats. So we were terrified that we were just going to have to sit around and wait for them to get sick. We did some sequencing of the virus from every one of these species and produced a tree which is completely unreadable, which I'm going to show you next. (laughs) And this is an evolutionary tree, which only thing I want to say is that it is possible to relate the relationship between the sequences of many viruses to each other in the following way. And the conclusion that I want you to point out is that all of these are lion viruses, and all of these are puma viruses, and these are leopard viruses, and these is actually hyena viruses down here. What this slide is meant to tell you is that every virus that we see always has as its closest relative another virus from the same species. Evolutionary biologists call this monophyly. just means that they're all close together if they're in a lion or all close together if they're in a puma. But 
How do we interpret that? Well, first of all, it means that these viruses are not jumping between species all the time. They jumped once, and then they evolved inside the species. And that's the way these viruses move around. They jump from one species to another, as is illustrated here. Now let's talk a little bit about the lions. The lions in the Serengeti are an amazing tourist attraction. There's about 3,000 of them all together. And they wander around in an ecosystem which is about the size of the state of New Jersey, tracking wildebeest. 100% of the lions in the Serengeti, over three years old, are infected with FIV. If you drive around and you see an adult lion looking on top of your Land Rover through binoculars, they're infected with FIV. This is a photograph of our team who drew blood from these animals. These animals are not dead. They're quite happy. They're anesthetized. They all got up and walked away. But I want you to believe me when I tell you that there was a time when we could gather specimens from these individuals and, and look at them. And what we found was that these animals were all infected with, with feline immunodeficiency virus. We isolated the virus, sequenced it, and so forth. But the ecologist said, you know, Steve, these animals are not getting sick. I think they've evolved a genetic defense against this virus. I think they're healthy. When I say the ecologist, I mean Craig Packer. I mean Ann Pusey. I mean the other lion biologists at the time. So if they weren't developing HIV or they weren't developing AIDS, they weren't dying like the house cats, why was that? Okay, so we wrote a paper and we said, well, we think it's all right. We don't think they're that sick. And then what happened? Now I'm going to shamelessly read you one page of a very good book that I wrote a few years ago. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's about a couple who were on safari in the Serengeti. Their name was Connie and Harold Chandler, and this was the year was 1994, I think. They rose at 4 a.m. in eager anticipation of the high point of their African safari, a hot air balloon ride across the vast Serengeti topped off with a champagne breakfast. Connie and Harold Chandler eagerly donned their Banana Republic vestments, then hurried to the balloon launch pad, a short Land Rover dried from the luxurious Serenera Tourist Lodge. It was January 1994, the perfect season to view the expansive vista of East Africa and its marvelous Wildlife. Now, the evening before, their tour drivers had regaled them with apocryphal yarns of obliging Robert Redford and Meryl Streep and their crew during the filming of Out of Africa. So the Chandlers gathered their snacks, sunscreen, and their camcorder onto the balloon deck in anticipation of a splendid Serengeti adventure. Now, as the sun crept up over the sweeping Serengeti plain, the balloon lifted them above endless herds of wildebeest zebra giraffe who had grazed the region to a brown stubble. You know, those fortunate enough to have visited an East African game park would spend countless hours in animated conversation reliving their euphoria. Most would also agree that even the best photographs are woefully inadequate in expressing its grandeur, so I apologize right now for the photographs. Yet, you just have to experience it to understand the extraordinary enthusiasm that the savanna expires. Now, the Chandlers were flying actually and spiritually when Connie spotted a trio of young male lions strolling below. The balloon descended and Harold started the camcorder rolling, but then it happened. The male in the rear began to twitch his whiskers. Soon, his conniptions became noticeable enough to spook his brothers, who took a few swats at the trembling adolescent and ran off, probably to avoid the descending balloon. The shivers progressed to tremors and then to severe muscle spasms. Then the unfortunate beach lurched into a grand mal neurological seizure, extending his front legs forcefully, flailing him into the air and crashing to the ground. For 30 agonizing minutes, the animal thrashed about as if it was possessed by demons, Finally, as the violent seizures and gyrations gradually lost intensity, the miserable creatures breathed 
his final torturous breath before the horrified ballooners. Nobody felt much like drinking champagne. The shaken tourist had witnessed something that few people, even trained veterinary clinicians, had ever seen. The acute neurological collapse of a large predator. But what had killed the lion? Was it a poison? Was it a nasty germ? Was it a hereditary ailment? The veterinarian in charge of the Serengeti at the time was a talented clinician named Melody Roki. The balloon pilot went and notified her She mentioned that she had been seeing weird things in the lion populations over the few months, including skinny lions when there was a lot of prey. In fact, what happened in the next six months was a 1,000 of the 3,000 lions living in the Serengeti ecosystem succumbed to a mysterious contagion between December 1994 and June 1995. Dr. Rolke set up the equivalent of an international health campaign to try to find out what was the cause. It was originally thought it was FIV, because FIV is a relative of HIV, and there were press releases out that the lions were dying of HIV. Because HIV causes AIDS, and one of the, one of the, one of the display phenotypes, pathologies of HIV is neurological symptoms. Melody wasn't sure. She wanted to prove or disprove that hypothesis. So she went out from dawn till dusk every day and darted every lion she could find. She basically gave them a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a uh, physical examiner, and she took tissues when she could. The animals were healthy, got up and walked away. The carcasses, she was able to get some from anything. She sent the tissues to... Veterinary College in Zurich, the University of Tennessee Veterinary College, Cornell Medical Veterinary School, and our laboratory. She says, what is it? A talented pathologist in Tennessee, Linda Munson, looked at the brain tissues of these individuals and said, I have seen this before. This pathology looks like something that happens not in cats but in dogs. Distemper caused by a morbillivirus. virus. But we all know the veterinary textbooks tell us, well, canine morbillivirus, virus, canine distemper virus only affects dogs. It'll infect cats, but it doesn't cause any disease. Max Appel at Cornell had monoclonal antibodies against the canine distemper viruses. He put them down in the tissues of these guys and discovered Bingo, they had these red deposits, which meant that his antibody was binding to something in this lion tissue and a number of animals <clears throat> that had died of, the, of whatever it was. There were six animals out of 40 who did not have HIV or FIV who also died. So that led us to exclude the possibility that HIV was the principal. And the morbillivirus virus became the next best candidate. During the period of the collapse of the population, one-third were lost, the incidence of antibodies against CDV went from zero in 1992 to 10% in 93 to 80% by the end of 1994. Postdoc in the laboratory designed PCR primers for a number of genes in the canine distemper genome and amplified DNA from many of the tissues in lions. What she discovered, Margaret Carpenter, was that the Serengeti lions indeed had sequences which were the first cousins of the canine distemper uh, strain, which was used for vaccines from South Africa. And, of course, the morbilliviruses are relatives of morbilliviruses in uh, Uh, seals, dolphins, porpoises, and the human measles and rinderpest virus. Rinderpest, of course, the cattle virus. Okay. So, and all the animals had it. In fact, when she looked at a number of lions, hyena, domestic dogs, bad-eared foxes around the Serengeti, she found that they all had a virus which was very similar to each other and a little bit distant from the domestic dog vaccine strain that she'd originally said was a match. This was a very Catholic virus. It didn't care what species it entered. It just went into each one, and it caused the disease in all of them. 
Now, where did it come from? Well, the Serengeti and the surrounding areas has an indigenous population of people called the Maasai tribesmen who are pastoral wanderers who herd cattle, and most of them have dogs. They did a survey. Craig and his colleagues did a survey. Sarah Gascoigne did a survey of the dogs, blood samples, in the next year or so, and they discovered that the incidence of antibodies against canine distemper in these domestic dogs was on the order of 60 to 80 percent. Now, you can't get dogs into the Serengeti legally. However, because it's against the law to bring domestic dogs in. So the intermediate is this guy, hyenas. Hyenas get crosswise with everybody. They get crosswise with dogs, they get crosswise with lions, and it's always bloody. They were endemic with the distemper, more belly virus. And that began a vaccine campaign, not of the lions, but of the domestic dogs, with a herd immunity idea of getting the immunity down. This was 15 years ago. There hasn't been a serious outbreak since. FIV was not responsible for the lion plague. Did it play a supporting role? Well, I didn't know, and Melody wasn't sure. We liked to listen to our ecologist friends, but we weren't sure. So they began, after this, a rather widespread study across many areas of the Serengeti to look at lions that were infected with FIV and those that weren't. They collected specimens from each of eight uh, different areas, and they brought the materials back. It was a great expense. I had to hire helicopters to fly these women veterinarians around. And uh, they basically did an amazing job of collecting tissues and, and monitoring them. And they looked for clinical correlates of HIV, also SIV, in these lions. And what the ones they looked at was, how about the CD4 or gingivitis or coviral infections? These are normal HIV AIDS-defining conditions. What happens when you monitor these, which all of which were seen occasionally in lions, in FIV versus FIV negative? The answer was quite striking. <clears throat> the red is positive for the disease listed on the bottom. For gingivitis, it was almost 90% in the positives and maybe 25 or 30% in the negatives. For dehydration, the same is true. It was twice as high in the FIV positives. Papillomaviruses, 60% in the FIV positives, 20% here. Less quantifiable was the presence of wasting. Animals that were skinny, that were underfed, that were not doing very well, um, and they were the histopathology demonstrated a chronic debilitation uh, in Kruger Park and also in the Serengeti. These were observed before, during, and after the CDV outbreak. Wasting. The clinical correlates associated with these were these, and every one of them was affected. Statistically significantly affected. This was not an innocuous virus in these lions. It was basically contributing to certain things. However, why do we think that it was innocuous? Well, I think it's a little bit like a matter of the lions tend to postpone the immune collapse of their system until they die of something else. There's a epidemiologist called this a completing mortality. It's a little bit, suppose HIV was dis discovered Suppose it was discovered in 19, or in 1865 in West Texas. Well, at that time, as is illustrated by all the cowboy westerns, including Los and Dove, these people didn't live very long. They had a lot of competing mortality. Indians would kill them. Snake bites would kill them. Disease would kill them. They'd get shot by each other. They were all dying before the, the disease could get them. If these guys were infected with HIV, you wouldn't know it. The same way with the lions. So we think that the lions are told us a little bit of lesson. The lessons from these cats stimulated me in my post at the NIH to start looking for human diseases. 
or human uh, genetic explanations and resistances for deadly diseases. And we began actually in the mid-1980s before this FIV outbreak. And we were looking for human genes that polymorphic variants that influence the outcome of HIV exposure infection. We gathered thousands of patients from epidemiologists who had characterized patients at risk for HIV. They were people in risk groups, uh, actively homosexual men, recipients of contaminated blood products before 1983 when the blood test was introduced, people who were IV drug injectors who were sharing needles in city slums where the HIV prevalence was approaching 90%. These were the risk groups. Some of them were getting AIDS, some of them were not. Some of them, when they got AIDS, they progressed at different rates. There are whole schools of public health dedicated to epidemiology, including here. And what they do is define heterogeneity in epidemics. Perfect. As a geneticist, I said, yeah, maybe some of that genetic, that difference has a genetic basis. The fledgling human genome project was getting started, and we were able to use the tools of amplification and allele recognition to test many, many genes that were thought to be involved with HIV. We discovered a number of AIDS restriction genes, but probably the one that is the best known was the receptor by which HIV enters cells. When HIV encounters a T cell, it binds to the CD4 receptor and then to a chemokine receptor, which is called CCR5. Once this discovery was made by five separate groups in 1996, published in Science, Nature, and Cell, within five days of each other, my group went to the lab where they had thousands of patients and began looking for mutations in the CCR5 structural gene. They discovered an interesting deletion in some people called CCR5 delta 32. It removed 32 base pairs, leading to a frame shift and the wrong amino acid and the stop codon. It was present in 10% of the Americans that we had in our cohorts, the allele frequency, which mean about 1% were homozygous. They had two copies of this deletion. They were pretty healthy. These people didn't know they had a problem with CCR5. However, when we went to the cohorts, what we discovered was that the people who were homozygous for Delta 32 People who had two copies, one from each parent, they didn't have any CCR5 on, on the surface. And the reason was that the garbage disposal detail in the endoplasmic reticulum of cells recognized this crappy protein as being no good and eats it up before it gets to the surface. So people who are homozygous have no CCR5 in the surface. So when we went to the cohorts, and we said, what's the frequency of the wild type or the normal or the heterozygous or the homozygous? We discovered, and this is a summary of now 17,000 people. Remember that in a few minutes, this number, okay? <clears throat> and what we saw was that the homozygotes were equally frequent in people who were um, uh, uh, negative or positive for HIV, uh, and the heterozygotes were too also. But the individuals who were homozygous never became infected. There were no positives. They were completely resistant. The reason is the doorway, CCR5, which HIV intercells, is gone. So we had a recessive restriction of HIV infection. Heterozygotes do become infected, people with one copy of the normal one copy. And when they do, when they progress to AIDS, they actually delay the onset of AIDS very slightly, about two years. It's statistically significant, not as much as the infection, but nonetheless, there's this modest delay. Now, I want to say a few things about CCR5 Delta 32. It's led to a whole discipline of trying to use it to help cure AIDS. It's to understand some background natural history. But I want to tell you about its background, because this is about plagues. 
HIV, or uh, Delta 32, which protects you against HIV, has an allele frequency of about 10% in Europeans. However, that frequency is not identical in all countries. It's actually pretty high up in Sweden. It's about 10% in Germany and in France, 5% in Greek and Italy, 0% in Saudi Arabia, and 0% in Africa, and 0% in Asia. It's not present in the Asian ethnicities, and it's not present in pure Native Africans. It's only present in Europeans. And this gene frequency gradient is called a Klein. And it's indicative of maybe something favoring it, perhaps some adaptive value up north, and then spreading down to the south. Now, why does a gene which knocks out a perfectly good function, like CCR5, what's the good function? CCR5 is a chemokine receptor. A chemokine receptor is a protein we know a little bit about. It uh, <clears throat> has to do with the fact that when you have an inflammation in a joint because it's bruised or it's infected or something, the inflamed joint shoots out these peptides called chemokines into the lymphoid system, and they're meant to attack lymphocytes. They bind to the lymphocytes through the chemokine receptor, and then they home in to the abrasion and try to fix it. I don't know how they fix it. I don't think anybody really does. But the point is, that's what they do. It's sort of one of the armaments of the immune system. Okay. The reason that CCR5 seems to be dispensable is that there are other chemokine receptors that bind to the same chemokines. So, okay, that makes sense. Why does a gene knockout like CCR5 exist at a high frequency in Europeans and not in Africans or Asian peoples? When was CCR5 Delta 32 born? What can we learn about AIDS resistance from the history of this variant? And now I will quote, not Charles Darwin, but Theodos Dubjansky, who is the namesake of the center that I direct in St. Petersburg. He says, nothing in biology makes any sense, except in light of evolution. If the Europeans have this, and the Africans and the Chinese don't, what that means is that the mutation probably occurred along the lineage after Caucasian ancestors, European ancestors, diverged from others. We know from a lot of data that about 100,000 years ago, the African peoples migrated out of Africa into Europe and then dispersed into Europe and then over to Asia, and then they split apart maybe 40, 50,000 years later. They also made it with the Neanderthals around this time. And there's a certain fraction of all your genes that come from the Neanderthals. We don't know if it's the good part or the bad part, but that did come from the Neanderthals. Okay? So this is beginning to make us think, okay, it's a recent addition. But how, when it took place, the populations in Europe was on the order of hundreds of thousands of individuals. So the day it was born in some baby... Let's say there were 100,000 Europeans. So if it occurred in the one mutation and the baby was born, then all of a sudden it had a frequency of 1 in 200,000. How did it get up to 1 in 10 today among you, which means that 1 in 5 of you is a carrier, a heterozygous carrier? Well, one of the possibilities is that the mutation had some kind of breathtaking advantage. Resistance, perhaps, to a deadly plague or infectious disease. Maybe it just was good for the people that had it. And that caused a selective jack-up or rise or advantage that favored the carriers. Plausible, not proven, a guess. If you look at other populations... For CCR5 mutations, there's about 20 of them that our team discovered. But there was something interesting about them. This is Delta 32. The others are all around here. Usually, when you have mutations in a gene, it's bad for you. It's sort of like taking a hammer to a 
Mercedes-Benz engine. One time in a thousand it might be good, but most of the time it isn't. <laughs> so what really happens here is the frequency of mutations that alter amino acids that actually do something is, is filtered out quickly. So that when you look at all the genes, the 20,000 genes across the human genome, the amount of uh, what do we call non-synonymous amino acid altering mutations is on the order of 20-25%. The rest of them are all synonymous. That is, they're mutations that occur, but they don't change the amino acid because they don't matter. That's not true of CCR5. 90% of the mutations in the CCR5 are amino acid altering. The only other place we've seen that is in the antigen recognition site of the major histocompatibility complex class 1 HLA genes. Whoa, what do you say? What does that mean? HLA is one of the principal immunological gene families that defends against deadly infectious diseases. It has enormous variation. Enormous. A hundred times, a thousand times more than other genes. And the reason is, it's good for you to be diverse at your immune system. Remember the cheetahs. Okay? So the MHC has a large amount of diversity. And the diversity is all in the site that recognitions peptide, so that individuals can recognize viruses and pathogens they've seen in the past and ones they haven't seen. The more, the better. Remember the cheetahs. CCR5 has more amino acid substitutions than HLA. So everybody now agrees. This is not argued. My friends, my enemies, they all agree. CCR5 was elevated by a recent breathtaking selective pressure, a history of natural selection. But what caused it? Mr. Darwin helped our thinking here. We don't know what caused it. But there's another piece of data I want to tell you about. And by the way, if you get too tired of listening to me, there's a short movie at the end, which is pretty good. Okay? Uh, it turns out that we can estimate when this mutation took place by looking at the neighborhood of genetic variation around the CCR5 gene. Why is that? Well, when a mutation takes place on a chromosome, it occurs on a chromosome that has a whole bunch of other mutations, maybe 100 upstream, 100 downstream over a short space. And they'll have some form or other, sort of like a signature. So the first generation, you just have this one form with all, this, all these different variants next to it. However, as mutation and breeding takes place, recombination clips it away and randomizes, randomizes the variants on either side. And the further away the variant, the quicker it goes away from being associated. And the closer it is, the longer it takes. So the length of the non-random part is actually a chronometer, which you can relate to time. So we took this. Now, the next slide's unreadable, too. But it illustrates for you that there are a bunch of variants around CCR5 that we looked at. And when we measured the length around it, the average length of the stretches in Caucasian, European, Americans, and Europeans is about 20,000 base pairs. CCR5 it's a million, much longer. We developed a simple algebraic equation, one you can do on a calculator you can buy from the local Walmart, to basically compute how long it was since the last selective event that favored CCR5 Delta 32. When we did that, it was 700 years ago. 700 years ago. So, I'm not a very good student in history like all of you. I went to the library and said, what was going on in Europe 700 years ago? And what was going on in Europe 700 years ago was the Black Death. The Black Death. So immediately, the cause of the Black Death came as a candidate. Well, maybe that jacked up CCR5, Delta 32. 
Then we went ahead and said, okay, well, we have this indirect data. We have the dating and everything like this. But let me tell you, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, there's an interesting history about the Black Death. It started out in the Burmese ghettos probably sometime in the 12th century. And there were supposed to have been tens of millions of Southeast Asians that had died. And then it came across the Silk Road to the Black Sea and into Messina, Sicily in 1348, uh, and uh, people were dying of this disease. It is a disease caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis, and it infects the individual. The bacteria has a plasmid, which has a bunch of um, <clears throat> proteins called YAPs, Yersinia operative proteins, that go up to macrophages, which is your first line of defense against bacteria and that it injects these poison darts into the macrophages and destroys their primary defense. Then it goes to the lymph nodes, it grows up, it explodes them, and it causes these bleeding black things called bubos, where the name bubonic plague comes from. It basically, within a five-year period, spread throughout Europe, up to, up to UK, France, Germany, around there, taking between 30 and 70 percent of the population, including here in Cambridge, quite a few. It was a huge, horrific thing. And it's carried on the backs of black rats and trans, transmitted uh, in marmot pelts, which, which, were, which were brought back. And the migration that I just described is illustrated in this old photograph about coming from Sicily and then up and then around, back around to the Black Sea. Something on the order of 50 million Europeans succumbed to this disease. And it was a horrific disease. And at that time, of course, there was no medicine. There was no, there was no uh, HMOs or pharmacies. These people, all they had was their theology. I thought the evidence was pretty good that uh, bubonic plague was a strong candidate. But other people thought that there were other things that could have been the cause of Plague. Some people thought maybe smallpox. Some people thought anthrax. There was a paper came out of Britain a few years ago that said it was a uh, uh, Ebola type virus, typhoid. These are all guesses as to what may have caused the Black Death and what also may have been responsible for CCR5 Delta 32 elevation. I wasn't sure about it all, but I knew that the devastation was enormous. About eight years ago, I heard about a town near Manchester called Eam. This is a little town of very few people, maybe a thousand people, that most of the people there are descended from the survivors of the Black Death. They have a little museum there. This is up near Manchester. You should go see it. And uh, the people in the town are very proud of the fact that they are descendants of the Black Death and nobody else moved in there. There haven't been any immigration. So I wondered if the average frequency around Manchester and London and, and other places in England was on the order of 10 to 11 percent, what's the, what would happen if I looked at the ancestors or the descendants, rather, of the survivors of the Black Death. So we went to the town, and we drew blood from 120 people. Actually, we didn't draw blood. We took a, a cheek swab and extracted the DNA. And I was thinking that if Delta 32 was protective against Yersinia pestis, then it would be higher in EM than it would be in the surrounding neighborhoods. And I wouldn't tell you the story if the results didn't turn out the way I wanted to. <laughs> but they weren't as good as I wanted. I mean, basically, the allele frequency came out to be 15%, but the incidence of the, of the homozygotes was 20%. Uh, homozygotes was twice as high, 3 or 4%. It was only 100 and some people, so it wasn't statistically significant, but it was in the right direction. And I was encouraged by that. But it was amazing to walk through this town where 50% of the people died during the Great Plague in the 17th century, uh, which was caused by Yersinia pestis. 
And this reminds me to tell you that the Black Death, as horrific it as was, and as much as it changed everything, wasn't the first or the last plague. There were one every generation up till the Great Plague. And I think the last one was in the 18th century in Marseille, where they had 40% mortality. The first one, the earliest one, was the Justinian Plague, which was in between 550 and 750 BC. And that was said to have taken 100 million people in Rome and Empire. Can you imagine counting 100 million people in Roman numerals? <laughs> this is basically an amazing result. I don't know if the numbers are right, but there was a lot of deaths. It certainly was enough to explain the elevation, if your city could be connected. Now, a few years ago, there was a paper published from a group which hasn't been repeated, but it was an interesting result. These workers were wondering whether our hypothesis was full of all wet or true. So they took mice, which are hypersusceptible to Yersinia, and they made knockouts. That is, they eliminated CCR5. So they had the equivalent of a Delta 32 homozygote mouse strain and a wild type strain. And then they infected it with Yersinia pestis. And they quantified how much infection they got with or without CCR5? And the answer was that Yersinia pestis requires CCR5 to get into these cells. That's what they reported. Photographs taken right out of the nature letter. <clears throat> Monty Slatkin, a good friend of mine from Berkeley, did some mathematical calculations and modeling and says it can't be Yersinia, there wasn't enough mortality. I said, Are you kidding? Of course there was enough mortality. He says, I think it was smallpox. <laughs> smallpox? How are we going to test that? This was back at the time where smallpox was being extirpated completely, completely, by the World Health Organizations. Then along came 911. At that time, there were biological anthrax Mailers that killed several people in the United States. And all of a sudden, people became a little bit more worried about bioterrorism and deadly diseases. The two places in the world where smallpox was housed was in Russia at a center and at the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. I was working at the NIH, was housed on Fort Detrick which is, has a history of being the center of excellence for biological warfare. Well, that stopped, but some of those guys are still there. So I found them, and I said, you know, can we test smallpox to see whether or not it requires CCR5? If I get you blood samples from people with alternative genotypes, can we infect them? He says, we couldn't have done this before, but he says, I think I can get permission. So we did. So we did the experiment. And we exposed human cells to, your senior pa or to smallpox. And here's what we found. Basically, we found that the difference between the wild type, the heterozygous, and the homozygous was indistinguishable. Smallpox gets into cells. It doesn't care what the Delta 32 genotype is. Pretty good. Again supported, at least in my head, that we had it. So CCR5 Delta 32 is a knockout mutation. It seems innocuous. It was born 600 years ago when the population was greater than 100,000. It shows dramatic evidence for breathtaking selective elevation. And it seems to be required for Yersinia and HIV to enter cells. It has no effect on smallpox infection. And the people in EM who are survivors of the plague have at least an elevation, if you believe the results, and you can't defend them statistically, but that's what we saw, nonetheless. So, we need to do the same experiment with your cinea on human cells. We're trying to arrange it. Found some guys in Russia who worked in these spooky things, and they're willing to do the experiment, so... We'll see what happens. Stay tuned. 
One more piece of data. CCR5 became interesting to many people because it was shown, for example, that the myxomatosis virus used CCR5 in rabbits to enter. Myxomatosis is a distant relative of smallpox. It's one of the things that led the smallpox camp to get invigorated. But many other viruses have been looked at for whether or not CCR5 is utilized by them, especially given all those mutations that clearly had nothing to do with the Black Death, but they were mutations probably to avert infections. Animals like, or viruses like to use CCR5. One of my colleagues, Phil Murphy at NIH, and his postdocs, did an experiment with knockout mice, the same mice that were done for the Yersinia experiment, same brain, and they said, does West Nile use it? Now, West Nile, of course, is a flavivirus, mosquito-borne. It arrived in the United States now about 14 years ago. It caused about 17,000 infections, and about 678 were fatal. They were monitored by the CDC in Colorado and in Atlanta. 20%, not all, 20% of the infection progressed in cephalitis, and 80% are subclinical. To date, there's no vaccine and no effective treatment. Phil wondered whether CCR5 was required for West Nile, so he did a simple experiment. He took a bunch of mice that were either CCR5 positive or CCR5 negative, and he exposed them to West Nile. And mice are very sensitive to West Nile virus. And what he expected was that the knockouts would be resistant. But that's not what he found. What he found was the wild type were resistant, and the knockouts all died in 12 days. CCR5 was the primary defense in these mice against West Nile. Did it work in humans? He went and got a hold of as many patients as he could, and he did association tests. And what he discovered was that when you looked at people infected with West Nile, they either got this deadly encephalitis or didn't. Remember I said 20% did, that the frequency of CCR5 delta 32 and the negatives was low, but the positives was really, excuse me, the, 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 the delta 32 homozygotes were elevated four to eight times in the people that got sick. So yes, delta 32 is a risk factor, a huge risk factor. Most of the people that die of, of West Nile virus are delta 32 homozygotes. So a lot of my friends have come up to me before this day to say, hey, I'm homozygous for delta 32, isn't that nice? because I'll never get HIV. I said, well, I don't know. But now, I had to tell all these people, you're going to have to avoid these cocktail parties in Florida in the summertime <laughs> because they have mosquitoes, they have West Nile, and this is not a joke. This is a serious risk factor for this. And it's true whether you look at just Caucasians or all races together. The difference is the Delta 32 genotype is what seems to be the major contributor to encephalitis when West Nile buys. So it's a mixed blessing. Let's look back, final couple of things. In 1996, HIV entry receptors like CCR5 was discovered and the triple drug therapy was discovered. But the translation of CCR5 has had some interesting variants. One is that Pharmaceutical companies began to develop antagonists to CCR5 binding HIV because they were invigorated by the resistance of the Delta 32 homozygotes. So there's about 10 of them, and three of them are now FDA approved in the last few years. And they're salvage drugs that are being used to block CCR5 from binding HIV. So this has been translated directly to the patients. My last example is an anecdote. This is Timothy Lee Brown. Tim is an American. He was living in Berlin. He became HIV infected. He's a gay man. And he, didn't, he, got to, he got on the powerful therapy. Didn't do very well. He didn't like it. It made him nauseous. He didn't want to take it. So he stopped it. And then he developed acute myelogenous leukemia, which is a death sentence for an AIDS patient. His doctor was a talented clinician named Gerald Hutter. 
he said to him, Mr. Brown, you're going to die. However, there is one option that we can do, and that's we can do a bone marrow or stem cell transplantation. We can use stem cells to make bone marrow cells to make lymphocytes. And what that involves is irradiating your old lymphoid system, getting a donor from a big bone marrow registry that matches your HLA type, and then infusing that in there and then crossing our fingers. But I've got to warn you. If you don't take the drugs, HIV will hide itself in reservoirs and will jump back. So eventually it's going to come back and you'll have to get back on the treatment. He says, okay, I'll try it. But then Garrow Hutter did something very interesting. He actually got two or 300 people who were compatible with Mr. Brown for donation. He asked for pieces of blood from each one. He genotyped them for CCR5, Delta 32. He was looking for a homozygote so that he could use Delta 32 as a homozygote donor for this bone marrow transplant. Number 77 was homozygous. Donor number 77. Called up the guy, got the blood, irradiated Mr. Brown, infused him with it. He suspended the antiretroviral treatment. He suspended the antiretroviral treatment because he wanted to give the graft a chance to grow back. But he monitored Mr. Brown for a week, a month, six months later, a year later. No antiretroviral drugs. Delta 32 donor. Virus never came up. He sent in an abstract to the World AIDS meeting. He was given a poster. (laughs) I walked by the posters. I says, this is really interesting. I says, this guy looks like he's suppressing HIV. He's the only guy in history. Everybody else has never, nobody's ever done that. And there's 40 million people infected with HIV. He published an article in New England Journal a year, two years later. And everybody said, well, it's really not a cure. It could be an anecdote. We don't know exactly. And then they set up a committee to study what happened to Mr. Brown. And they said... You know, he's probably still got HIV someplace that just hasn't had a chance to come out. He's still on no drugs. This is three years later now. No HIV. No, no rebound. They said, well, we need to look and biopsy his tissues. So if I gave you a list of tissues, you'd be horrified. They wanted to look at his testis. They wanted to look at his, his, lim- his lymphoid cells, his kidney, his liver, his, 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 his neurological tissues. They wanted to look at everything. And Mr. Brown was so happy to be alive, he agreed. <laughs> they went into it. They used the most sensitive PCR methods available, detect one half of a virus in a milliliter blood, found nothing. It's now, I think, seven or eight years later, And everybody says, Mr. Brown was cured. He has not recovered. He goes to AIDS meetings now. He gives talks. And he's basically the one person. In addition to that, the problem, the caveat is that this is exciting. But it's not a treatment for everybody because one-third of people who get bone marrow transplant get a disease called graft-versus-host where the graft attacks the host and kills the patient. One-third mortality is not what you want to hear when you're going into a procedure. So what they've done is they've used zinc finger knockout technology, this is at Penn and in UCLA, to knock out CCR5 in patients who have HIV, who have a bad prognosis, and then infuse these synthetic delta-32s back into the patients and see whether or not they get the same good result as Mr. Brown. And the answer is that it's very promising, but it's too early to say. The truth is CCR5 has been a very interesting ride. But HIV is not as horrible as it used to be. I talked to you about the promising bone marrow transplants. Some of the vaccines have partial 
there is something called pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a combination of drugs given to people at high risk, which will reduce infection and transmission by five or six-fold. There are vaginal mycobicides that are important. And interestingly enough, the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief was started by this gentleman, President George Bush. It's probably the one thing in his legacy that everybody agrees was good. (laughs) And it is basically to convince the Congress to put $15 billion into treatment in the developing world to help stem. This guy got the price down from $10,000 to $15,000 to about $150 a month for treatment. And Millions of people are now on treatment. He then added $48 billion in 2008 and 2004. This is more than the people before George Bush and certainly more than the people after Mr. Obama. Education is working too. I gave you the story about the natural history. Finally, this is the age quilt. It was displayed in 1996 on Columbus Day in the Washington Washington Mall. It's the last time it was displayed. It's over 17,000 quilts, each one the size of a coffin, commemorating one or two or partner a pair of AIDS patients. It's the last time it was displayed in full because it got too big. Maybe it would fit on the Heathrow Airport. There's been a lot more people involved in this work than myself. Mitch Bush and David Wilt were pioneers in helping develop the wildlife. Lori Marker has told the story of cheetahs and worked with us for over 30 years. Melody Rolke was the chief veterinarian in the Serengeti study, and also she was part of the cheetah study in the beginning. For the SARS work, I'd like to thank this all-girl cast of Allie Wilkerson, Emma, Jennifer, Gila, Jill, Melody, Lori, and Meredith. And for the FIV study, it was led by Jennifer Troyer and uh, 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 Melody Rolke. The plague story had a number of collaborators uh, with CCR5, including Bob Fisher and Clay Stevens and David Reich. This is the team that did the HIV restriction discoveries This is the Laboratory of of Genomic Diversity, which I led at NIH until two years ago. And the informatics that we're doing now is led at the Dubjansky Center by myself and Pavel Pezner. This is our group. And last of all, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Stephen, thank you. I mean, you've demonstrated so clearly the the major advances in understanding that genomic data make possible uh, and the opportunities and tools and the challenges that follow from that understanding. I mean, all I can say is thank you really very, very much for a truly wonderful lecture. So next week, the Darwin College lectures continue with Professor Stephen Emmett from Microsoft Research, who will talk about the human plague. In other words, all of us. So thank you. We'll see you again then. Okay. Thank Thank you. you.